Amen. Hey, Preach it, sister. Yeah. Preach it. <laughs> Only like a good southerner. <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 13 of the HelpMeWithHIPAA.com podcast. In today's episode, we will be covering risk analysis. And joining me today, as always, is Donna Grendel, Carding Compliance. How are you, Donna? I am fantastic, David. How are you? I'm sure you are. So before we actually press the record button, we were talking about a few things that were in the news here lately. And um, Donna enlightened me on a little incident that occurred with a football player. I'll let her share the details about that, but it's pretty interesting of how things has transpired in the violation of his HIPAA rights. So tell us about it. Yeah, uh, for those that haven't followed it or don't follow football, NFL player Jason Pierre-Paul, who is a player for the New York Giants, he's a big name up there, comes out in the news uh, this week that he has had a finger amputated. He expects to play for the football season just fine because, thankfully, he's not like a receiver or quarterback or anything where that would matter. He, having a finger amputated, everybody's like, what? Why would that happen? And here comes the ESPN reporter with a picture of uh, medical records showing Jason Pierre-Paul, or JPP, as he's known by his fans and others, that uh, he had his finger amputated, apparently something to do with blowing it off with uh, fireworks. And I, I know it was painful, and I know it's a very sad thing, but anybody that blows a finger off of fireworks, I'm just sorry. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, what what's funny about it is, you know, as soon as this comes out, all of us HIPAA people, in fact, uh, Jason, who works with us, he's sending an email right away. He's like, HIPAA violation, because we're all, you know, so attuned to that. And we're like, I wonder what's going to happen. Well, the next day, everybody's freaking out. And we hear conversations on sports radio about, oh, is this guy going to be fired for violating HIPAA? Well, the reporter didn't have any obligation whatsoever to stick with HIPAA. So, you know, it's where did he get it is the big question. And we thought that was rather humorous that you know, people have no idea what HIPAA really means if they think that a reporter is going to be fired from their job for reporting on something that they got in a medical record. But then the next day is, what was it? How was it phrased, David? The hospital is a... Yeah, they're aggressively... Aggressive investigation it, trying to figure out what happened. Now, the hospital needs to figure out who let this information out because either a system failed or somebody's going to get fired Mm because, you know, it's not something clearly that should have been released and the details of it and they could have kept it quiet as far as what happened. And, you know, I'm sure he's not wanting everybody to know. And here's this football player who likely has – uh, very deep pockets and possibly the New York Giants now who may want to sue the hospital. So the hospital is going to be very aggressive, clearly. And, you know, they might as well post it on the wall of shame, even though it's only one patient. Because <laughs> everybody knows. <laughs> well, we learned. Yeah, well, we learned after, uh, I think it was the last podcast we did, you know, you talked about a pretty severe fine for a one-person breach. So we definitely know it can cost a lot of money, even though it's just one. Yeah, so it's out there. But, you know, on the upside, people are talking about HIPAA. The downside, they don't really know it. But if you don't start with ignorance, you can't learn it. You know, we all had to learn it at some point. And the Mm -hmm. good news is people are explaining and talking about, okay, yeah, the reporter has done nothing wrong legally at all. In fact, the reporter's just done their normal job trying to get the information. It's the person who allowed it to happen or the system that allowed it to happen that is the failure. And uh, there's where your HIPAA violation is, is in the person that's responsible for the data and, and protecting it. So there you go. So we can say, yeah, we can say now that HIPAA has hit prime time. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, you often wonder in sports. In fact, we've had multiple conversations amongst uh, my, you know, nerdy friends that know HIPAA and like sports like I do of exactly how does HIPAA affect those scenarios where you've got a sports celebrity and their entire living is done based on their ability to perform these amazing athletic tasks and feats, I guess is the rather better word. And if they have a severe health problem, well, technically the hospital can't tell it, but the team can tell it. But can the hospital tell the team and where do they draw that line? And I'm sure uh, it should be in the contracts with all of these athletes uh, if it's not somebody's missing the boat. Mm -hmm. So that'll be interesting to watch how that plays out. Yes, it will. We're going to keep an eye on what gets released about that aggressive investigation. Yeah, we'll keep watching the releases about the release. (laughs) (laughs) So what, you had a rant. You had a rant. Yeah, I do have a rant. So in in a previous podcast, I mentioned that I have a, a client that called me and it was a business associate. And in the process of talking to them, I didn't realize it in the beginning that they were a business associate. So once I realized that, I kind of stopped and said, hmm, we need to have a conversation about compliance and HIPAA because you're clearly not doing anything related to HIPAA. Not some things, but anything, nothing. So uh, I had went back to that client a couple days ago and I talked to the office manager and I said, so tell me what did your boss lady have to say about having a conversation around HIPAA? And she says, oh, she didn't say anything. She just rolled her eyes, <laughs> which told me, it told me everything I needed to know. But my rant really is that if covered entities would be, would do their job of doing due diligence and putting pressure on the business associates, you wouldn't have that type of attitude or dismissal of compliance. They would be forced to be in compliance because covered entities are taking this stuff seriously. And I can tell you that a lot of BAs, are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're going to have a breach. They're going to have something to happen. And you're never going to know about it because they're not looking at what's happening. They're not going to report it to you. I don't care if they sign a BAA or not. They don't even know what they should be doing or what they should be monitoring or anything. And you're going to find out, like we've seen before, you're going to find out from a patient or somebody else that there was a breach that occurred. And you're going to have to track down where that came from because it, they're not taking care of the information. I think the thing that makes me mad about it is not the fact that they're not taking HIPAA seriously. The thing that makes me mad about it is that somebody somewhere has entrusted information that should be kept private and secure. And they've entrusted it to somebody, and it's been given to people who just don't care, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, that is the ultimate goal of HIPAA, is the law that says you should be doing something Here's how you're going to do it, and you're required to do specific things that apply to protecting the information you've been entrusted with. And people don't see it as something they've been entrusted with. They see it as something that is just, oh, it's just a piece of paper. Oh, it's just a spreadsheet. It's not. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's a perfect segue into our topic today, which is what is a risk analysis? Because a proper risk analysis in both of these things we've talked about so far, a proper risk analysis would more than likely point out the problems with these things so that they can be addressed before they become national news or (laughs) even local news. And be caught (laughs) and stopped. Yeah, that's the whole key is is risk management. So in order to manage a risk, we must analyze (laughs) the risk so that we can mitigate it. So let's talk a little bit about what a risk analysis is. And we know that it's like anything else in HIPAA, it's not a checklist. It's not something that you can just go down and check, yeah, we did this, 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 and that's it. It requires a lot of thought, a lot of data collection, a lot of analysis. So I'm going to turn that over to you, Donna, and let you run with how do we we start out with a proper risk analysis? I'm supposed to know that? You're supposed to know that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you and I both know how often the confusion goes over risk analysis, risk assessment, security risk assessment, all these different terms that people use. And what you end up with is an uncertainty of what's actually been done and what's included in a lot of these assessments that people are doing. 
And whether you're doing it internally or you're buying it from somebody or you're using a book, they vary so widely on what's actually being done. Hopefully, our discussion is going to try to narrow this down a little bit and explain the pieces and parts that should be there according to the law and narrowly define a risk analysis instead of it being so broad and lumped in with all these other things. We hope with your help, David. I will. I will help you along the way. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So first of all, a risk analysis, it's not just a little checklist. It requires a great deal of thought, data collection, and actual analysis. So many people uh, say the risk analysis is just a big spreadsheet, and I go down through here and I say, yes, no, one, two, three, and then I'm done. That is not an analysis. You have not analyzed anything. You've just answered a bunch of questions. So here is the process that you should go through in order to properly do any kind of risk analysis, not just a HIPAA one, but we're going to deal specifically with HIPAA. So... You define where the thing you need to protect is, and for HIPAA, it's EPHI. And according to the Mm -hmm. law, we must define all of the places that PHI is created, received, maintained, or transmitted. I call that cremated. (laughs) I know. That's easy to remember. C-R-E-M-A-T-E-D. Cremated. And we'll put that in the show notes so you can see how it works. Yeah, and hopefully... (laughs) It'll help you remember. It's how I do it. I remember CIA and cremated. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the PHI must be maintained. And in order to protect it, anybody who creates, receives, maintains, or transmits it must, in the HIPAA law, follow all of the rules that apply accordingly. And the Mm -hmm. step one of the security rule, which applies to everybody, whether a covered entity or a business associate, you first define your risk analysis because pretty much the rest of the security role relates back to that. Right. Yeah, you can't go anywhere unless you've analyzed and find out where do you need to be putting your resources and your security and privacy measures. Yeah, what do my policies and 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 procedures need to do? It's not Mm -hmm. just a real generic thing. And so I love people who tell me they're HIPAA compliant, and I say, okay, let me see your risk analysis. Uh, What? (laughs) Uh, We have one of those, and they give me a spreadsheet. It doesn't answer the questions. So first of all, we define all the places that PHI is in your office. It's not just a server. This your EMR server. And you have to worry about, like, downloads folders on PCs and temp folders on the, you know, network devices. You have to worry about the copiers, digital copiers, mobile devices, and tablets, and all of those kind of things, as well as the things that most people think of, which is the server. And then, of course, Mm -hmm. you know, our favorite thing is the people who say, well, we don't have to worry about it because we're in the cloud. You and I always love that. Yeah, it drives me nuts. And and one thing that you kind of alluded to just now that I want to mention specifically is the texting of PHI, which is a big problem. Mm-hmm. I see that happen a lot. People are texting confidential information or they're sending you know, pictures of things over text messaging, and you can't do that over a standard uh, text messaging platform. Well, yeah, and the interesting thing is your answering service sends you a text. Hello, that's that's also mm-hmm. it. And we, we've actually had cases where in our risk analysis, we ask these questions and we say, okay, what PHI is on your mobile devices? Do you text message? Blah, blah, blah. We find this out and we say, well, you can't do that. That's not secure. And we ask the answer service and they go, yeah, we have an app. <laughs> what? Why didn't you? I don't, It does it cost more? Nope. <laughs> Why has no one done this? Okay, so anyhow, that's the whole point of the risk analysis is you evaluate everything. And we, you know, when you, people will often say, well, that's it. That's the only place it is. And then we go ask two or three of the clinicians, the people actually using the data or the billers or any of those kind of people that use the data. And they'll tell you two or three other places that they're accessing it or, you know, they're maintaining it, or it's being transmitted to. So Mm -hmm. you have to do that. And you also have to worry about the vendors and consultants, your BAs, 
they're moving data around. If they're doing a transmission for you, you should know how it's secured. Or where it's stored. Yeah. Because yeah. I like the uh, thing I talked about at the first part of the podcast. I know for a fact their PHI is being stored in an insecured cloud-based storage service yeah. that is not HIPAA compliant. And um, you know how many clients' information do they have? How many patient records might they have? And things like I have no idea. But you know the covered entities either don't know or don't care. That, that information is sitting out there somewhere insecured and, and not under compliance. Well, they make an assumption in the one that you mentioned. Oh, well, it's an, a lawyer, so they absolutely know about the HIPAA law. Well, no, no. You don't expect a divorce attorney to know everything about, say, the HIPAA law. And believe it or not, ones who handle malpractice cases aren't worried about the HIPAA law a lot of times because that's not the part of the law they focus on. So don't assume. Mm-hmm. So one of the other things is you go through and you ask all your providers, your clinicians, where are you using the data? You check for the billing. You find out where they're accessing your client or your patient information. And then... You check with the vendors or the IT consultants and those people to say, where do you move the data around for us? Okay, well, you do a claims transmission every day. Hello, transmission. How's that being handled? Where's the data moving from and to? How's it being secured? Do you have a document that defines that from your vendor? Who's checking on it? Who's making sure nothing's being turned off so that that's no longer secured? There's a whole list of things that should be checked out so you don't have uh, something hanging out there that you don't even realize is not being secured. And you could do that with, okay, you got a lab interface. I got an interface with a fax service. Oh, online faxes. Kill me. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, we're very secure. But then you take the fax and email it open with a PDF. (laughs) No, (laughs) it's not secure anymore. So, But these are all the questions that you have to ask. So then you have this whole long list of all the places that you know that data is being created, received, maintained, or transmitted. It's being cremated. So all of those places then, you now have to say, what kind of threats to the CIA actually could affect it. So threats Mm -hmm. to the CIA of the PHI. Right. The confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Very good. And you have not only, you know, the threats that we think of, you know, a lot of people are like, well, we don't have hurricanes, so I'm not going to worry about that. Okay. That's just a minor part, very minor. In fact, it's not the biggest part that could affect your CIA. The big things you have to worry about, not only natural disasters, but what about human problems? I've got bad employee morale as a risk because it is. If I have an employee that is just totally negative and hates their job and tells everybody about it, I should be checking them out. That's something I should worry about and know what I'm going to do about it. As far as their access to PHI, that's something I should be paying attention to, right? And Mm -hmm. then I also have things like hackers, and I have unauthorized access to my network. So how am I going to make sure that I don't have somebody over in, you know, I got six locations and I have somebody over in another location that thinks, hey, I'm going to bring in this kid, a teenager to clean out this closet and I don't mention to him at all anything about patient information. I don't worry about it because it's just the closet. Yet there's boxes in there that say, PHI, do not throw out. (laughs) Kid throws them out. They don't care because it's a teenager. So you've got to worry about, am I going to allow somebody in that shouldn't be in? And how do I make that list of everything that could go wrong? And one of those things is to sit around and just brainstorm. I've got my whole list of where all this stuff is at. How could things go wrong? So back to your text messaging thing. Well, it's just my phone and my phone uh, has a password on it. Mm Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and do I have a way to wipe it remotely? Mm-mm. Do I have to, you know, oh, well, you know, I don't let anybody use my phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've never given it to one of the kids that's complaining to let them play a game. Don't go there, you know. So there's a lot of things that people, you know, try to write off, and those are the things that get them in trouble. So likely, whoever took that picture that the Jason Pierre-Paul story broke with, 
That was done with a cell phone. I bet you anything, don't you? you know, yeah. Somebody took a picture of it and sold it. Or even, you know, maybe the reporter was allowed inside of something, poking around the hospital and took a picture of it. Even then, still something that's a risk. So someone that's in the office that's a visitor having access to data, that's a risk as well. So you make that list of human, natural, environmental kind of risks to that are threats, actually, something that can attack or affect the confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So not just disasters, but human disasters, internal, external, (laughs) all of those kind of things. We have people that need to worry about a pipe bursting over their server. I've actually had it happen in a doctor's office, and it burst over the server next to the last bits of paper charts they still had. So it ruined Mm -hmm. the charts. And thankfully, there was something else, you know, mounted in the rack above the server that it was killed, but it protected the server and no water went through, luckily. So that was a good thing. But I should worry about that. I should worry about floods in the office, not just from a storm ripping the roof off or those kind of things, but a pipe bursting and really cold temperatures. So those are the kind of things I put on my list. And you say, okay, now how big of an impact would that be to my business if that threat actually happened against my PHI? If it was actioned, acted out, if it occurred against the PHI, and the way I like to look at it when we're trying to say what size of an impact would it be, is it a bump in the road or is it a freaking sinkhole that now I can't drive down that road? So you're driving Mm -hmm. down your little PHI road and one of these things happens. (laughs) Is it just a speed bump that slows you down a bit? Is it a big speed bump that slows you down a lot? Or is it a sinkhole that I can't even now travel on the road without having to repair it? And that's an easy Mm -hmm. way to look at the impact. And so most people would give that a a numerical value. Yeah, one, two, or three. You know, high, medium, low. Five. Tiny, medium, giant. Pick (laughs) something that works for you. Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> is it a speed bump, a big hole, a pothole, or a sinkhole? There you go. <laughs> but then you identify that impact, and then you say, okay, what is the likelihood that this will actually happen? Okay, so the likelihood that I'm going to be hit by a tornado where I am at is low. The impact would be very significant if it knocked out my office where my server is, the impact would be significant. So it would be a very high impact, but low likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. So now I say, all right, so this is where I have all of my information. I now have all the things that could go wrong that I can think of. And I determine how big of a deal would it be if it actually happened to me. And then, well, what's the likelihood of that happening to me? And then I use all that information to say, what's my risk then to PHI based on this? So my risk is, let's say, if I have a, we'll go back to the tornado thing, it would be a huge impact, but the likelihood is so low because I don't live in like Tornado Alley, you know? If you live in some of those areas in the Midwest where, you know, you just never know what's going to happen, then you have to say that the likelihood is pretty high that you could be hit, or at least medium. It can't be low. So now I can say if I have a high impact but such a low likelihood, the risk to my business is low, probably with a tornado. You know, I can make that, but it's a decision I have to make. It's not something that's a computer really should make. It's a decision I need Mm -hmm. to make. Another tool that we use is we look at, uh, say, the police reports, the crime reports in the area, and we say, what's the, you know, we know the impact of a break-in and theft would be high. What's the likelihood? Well, I'm going to use this crime report to show how I rated the likelihood. Then I can say that overall, that is a high risk in my business, right? So now, Mm -hmm. once I've done that, so now I've added that to my list. It's a whole nother column that I've added to the list. And now I know all of these things. And now I look at each one of those and I say, am I going to accept this risk is just part of doing business? Am I going to address the risk and create some sort of safeguards in my organization or policies and procedures or whatever I need to do internally 
to mitigate that risk? Or am I going to outsource the management of that risk by hiring somebody else? Am I going to outsource the management of malware issues to an IT company, right? So right. now you've done all of that and you've got this nice big list that shows you all the things you considered and all the places that you could be uh, hampered and you're able to then say, all right, here's the ones I'm going to address. Here's the ones I'm going to outsource and here's the ones I'm going to just accept is the likelihood is so low that even though it's a huge impact, I'm not going to really worry about it, or the impact is so low, even though it's a medium likelihood, I'm not going to worry about it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So that then is a true risk analysis. So I have an I've analyzed. <laughs> I shall analyze. All right. So once you analyzed it, <laughs> now then now what do you do? So all the things. So you put all this together and, and basically you're, I mean, it's really easier than you think it is once you start kind of looking at it. You're just basically taking it and going, okay, you know, where's the problems at or where could they be? And then how bad would that affect my business and what am I going to do about it? And then you just put that down on paper. And from there, you can create the risk management plan, which is Another podcast, I'm well, sure. Yeah, that's a whole risk management plan is your ongoing plan. But what's important to note here is once I do that and I have my list, now I go and I look at what I'm required to do under HIPAA or what I need to do internally to make sure that I'm addressing those risks. And that is your assessment where you're actually looking at this analysis of risk, all the things I need to be worried about. Now, am I worrying about those in my policies and procedures? Do I have policies and procedures in place for the ones that I say I'm going to address internally? Do I have a business associate contract for all the ones that I say I'm going to outsource? And have I an, uh, done a thorough analysis of those? So now I make a list of all of those things that I need to do, and I have a full report that says, okay, here's my risk analysis and my assessment of how I'm doing in addressing those risks. And then the last part of that is your mitigation plan and your management plan because that's the output here. But the cool thing is if I do this right and I have it sitting there, anytime something new happens in the business, I can go back to that report, that one risk analysis report and see if all of my stuff in there already would address this new thing. Or if I come across a new risk and I'm, oh, wow, I never thought that that could happen to me, but I heard about it on the news. Now I'll go put it on my risk, my risk list, and I add it on there. And now I'm documenting that I've thought this through. I've looked at the seriousness of it. And before, I would not have even put on there uh, an employee using or a, a visitor using a camera on their phone to take pictures of the screen, maybe. That's a risk to my PHI. It would have a high impact, and the likelihood, because everybody coming and going these days has a camera phone, is high, right? So mm -hmm. I really can't look at that and not say it's not a high-risk item. So now how am I going to deal with that? Well, the only way to truly deal with that is to address it internally. So now I can go look at those things. But I put it through the whole process, right? Yippee, right. Skippy. <laughs> so you, you bring up a good point. And this is often a question that gets debated. How often should you do your risk analysis? Should it be something you do annually, every so often? And there's always debate around that. But, you know, somebody's going to ask that question. So how often should you look at this risk analysis or, or revamp it or just go through the whole process again? Well, it's not something that's one and done. Uh, you can't say that that's the way you do it. Um, the law says that you must do it on a regular basis or when there is a change in your business that could affect your risk. So the way that I tell everybody to do it is, you know, if you can't tell me when you did the last one, or if you can't tell me that you did the last one following these kinds of uh, methods, then do one as soon as possible. If you can tell me that in the last two years you did one following these methods, you're probably doing pretty well, but you need to make sure that you don't let it go three years without doing another one. You know what I mean? 
Uh, I mm-hmm. would say that the minimum you need to do is every other year if you're not doing it every year. But anytime there is a change in your office and your business, you need to do another. You add a location, you need to do another risk analysis starting from the top. If you remodel your office, you need to do a new, another risk analysis because now maybe I've added a door or I've added a new equipment or tools. So I need to go back and review, does this change any of the things that I'm already doing? Do I need to add things? Do I have now a new environmental or human threat to my PHI? And that's the part that most people miss is that, okay, well, we're going to add a whole new service. So we're going to now have uh, a whole nother physician that comes in that's in another specialty, but it ties in with ours. I'm a neurosurgery group, and I'm going to add neurology. And the neurologists are going to do X, Y, and Z. That means I need to do a risk analysis. I need to go back to the drawing board and make sure I'm addressing everything because am I going to add new things? Am I going to use new features? Am I going to interface with new systems? Because they run different tests and they have different uh, access to information that they need. So the answer to how often should I do this is I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> it's just like everything in HIPAA. It's what's reasonable and appropriate in your business. Mm-hmm. So once we get this nice, fancy risk analysis, then we can put it in a manila envelope and stuff it in a drawer somewhere and say we've done it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no. It is, it is your working document for security. And that's what we always say is that you use this to inform your decision-making process and everything else that you're doing for security should be reflected in some way in your risk analysis and risk management report saying, I'm doing this because I need to correct that problem or mitigate that risk. I'm not doing that so that I can correct that problem. So it's those kind of things. And you you may have some business associates as well that may need access to that analysis. Like, you know, I do IT. So when we walk in, a lot of times that's one of the first things we ask for is the risk analysis because we want to know what we're dealing with and and what the environment is like and what have you already looked at or had problems with and where do we need to protect and secure that information. Yeah, when we go in to do compliance assessments, you know, that's we're going to give you a list of documentation that if you have it, we want you to give it to us. We do not want you to run off and rush and create it. We just want you to give it to us if you already have it. And, you know, your risk analysis and risk uh, management report, those are the, some of the first things we're going to ask for. And uh, surprisingly, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of uh, good detail we get back in a lot of cases. So. We get excited when we do get it. <laughs> yeah, I often get questions, you know, like, uh, what should we do about, you know, whatever, X, Y, Z? And I usually respond with, well, what does your risk management plan say? Or your policy yeah. and procedure? And What's I, your policy say? <laughs> and they look at me like, what? Yeah, we, do we have one of those? <laughs> then they go to the book and the book goes, because they only have it in a, you know, three-ring binder. So that's what They'll say, you know what, I... I do remember hearing an episode on Help Me With Hippo about that. that. (laughs) Well, you know, and the other thing that we do need to say is if you are doing these things, if you do not have the risk analysis, if you do not have the risk management plan, if you do have just a three-ring binder and that's all you have for HIPAA and you're not really sure what's in it, we don't want you to hide. We want to help you. That's help you with HIPAA. Yuck, 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 yuck. We're here. We want to help you. We say these things because we know they're wrong to be, it's wrong to be in that state. But at the same time, if you are in that state, you're not alone. Don't be ashamed of the fact that you're in that state. We have so many people that don't want to tell us the truth about where they are when we start asking questions. I'm not going to turn you in. I'm not going to, you know, call the HIPAA police. I'm not going to ridicule you, (laughs) but I am going to tell you, you need to do these things to properly meet your obligations to your patients. And I say you're meeting your obligations to your patients, privacy and security, first and foremost, and then to the law, because your obligation is to the patient. Amen. Hey, just to preach yeah. it. 
<laughs> Only like a good Southerner. All right. <laughs> so there you have it. How to do a risk oh, analysis. What What a risk analysis. Seriously, you, what is a you, risk analysis? How do you say that? And, and analyze. How do you uh, say that? I don't know. We'll have to go back and listen. And, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. So we'll just cut it right there. <laughs> You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.